All right, we're live. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Techstars AMA and today's exciting topic. I'm so excited about the future of retail and the convergence of the physical and digital shopping experience. Um, I'm Brandy Alexander Wimberly. I am co-founder and managing partner of Space Shop Commerce. We are an e-commerce agency that specializes in helping brands and manufacturers and retailers design, build, and grow e-commerce channels. And I'm also a Techstars mentor, and I'm thrilled to be hosting today's session. Um, I'd like to kick things off by introducing our amazing panel of e-commerce experts. Um, I'm joined today by Shazana Manji, head of product marketing retail division at Shopify, um, and Al Bruno, managing director of Techstars Western Union Accelerator, and Sunil Gowda, founder and CEO of Garmentory. Um, I'll kick things over to Shazana for a quick intro. Hi, everyone. Um, I lead product marketing at Shopify. Basically, my job is to work really closely with our product teams to think about um, the innovation we're going to have in our roadmap and then helping uh, bring that to market, working closely with partners and uh, the merchants that use the platform to really think about blurring the lines between um, selling in person and selling online. Great. Al? Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is El Bruno. I always find these crowd crowdcasts kind of awkward because we can't see you. But <laughs> regardless, <laughs> um, you may be wondering why the managing director of a Techstars program is on this panel. Um, I, I am new to the Techstars world. So uh, most recently, uh, for the last 18 years, I've been in the consumer and retail space. Um, I was the head of sales for a startup called Trunk Club, which was a men's outfitting service acquired by Nordstrom back in 2014. Um, went on to be involved in more uh, consumer brands. And most recently, I was the chief revenue officer of a direct to consumer furniture brand called Interior Define that also has uh, six brick and mortar locations. Cool. Thanks, Great. Al. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sunil uh, founder and CEO of Garmentry. Garmentry is a marketplace of independent boutiques, close to over 1,000 uh, sellers on our platform from all over the world. It's a curated marketplace. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, please go check it out. Uh, we were, uh, prior to this, uh, I was uh, an engineer at both Expedia and Zillow. So that's where I kind of like, kind of like, uh, got my bearings in marketplaces and found this new niche uh, that probably has like, like it's right for some kind of like, like uh, disruption and innovation uh, to kind of like use like, cons, like, like you know, entrepreneur terms. Uh, we were a Techstars 14 grad from Seattle so if any of you are uh, considering the program, uh, please do apply. Uh, great program. Uh, we enjoyed it. We got a lot of value out of it. So. Awesome. OK, cool. Let's get started. So um, I do want to mention that you can uh, attendees can ask a question. If you hover in the lower part of your uh, interface here, you'll see the ask a question. Um, please put your questions in there versus the chat just so we know where to source the questions from. Uh, and, and we'll take questions in about 30 minutes or so after the after we uh, get through the conversation. Um, but I wanna start out by talking sort of about the elephant in the room. We're coming out of 2020, an absolute game changing year for e-commerce. And I'll throw it over to Shazana. Um, how are, you know, what you're seeing on the Shopify side of things, how are digital and physical retail converging? And what transformation are you seeing in that physical digital space? Yeah, um, it, it's definitely been um, an interesting year. So um, I actually sit on the side of working on our in-store uh, products at Shopify, our point of sale system. And uh, something that we've definitely seen as like just like a massive trend is um, there's so many local businesses that would never have ever thought about being online, right? Like I serve my local community. Um, I proximity is my greatest selling feature. Um, and through the pandemic, it's created this mental shift for retailers of all sizes that not only to grow, but to survive you need to be thinking omnichannel. Like you need to be able to sell your products both in store and online and being able to pivot that strategy based on even um, what's happening with the pandemic, with store closures, reopenings, closures again. Um, so that agility that merchants have of all sizes to um, meet customer needs um, is just radically shift, shifted in the last year. Like we don't need to convince people that right. you need to be online anymore. 
Yeah. And, and I would just add to that, you know, I think, yes, this is such a fascinating time to be in consumer. Um, you know, I, and I think it actually started pre COVID, right, with the emergence of Gen Z. And I talk a lot about Gen Z, and they are the very first digital first generation. And so there's so much to be done with that generation around retail and consumerism um, that we haven't been able to do in the past. Uh, from a digital perspective. But then what's so fascinating about COVID hitting is that, yes, we've seen a surge for sure in commerce, but where we've seen the biggest increase is that 60 plus category. So it's the older generation that has now adopted to <laughs> online consumerism. And so it's kind of like taking those two generations on both ends and, and, and bringing them together. That's like, wow, this is a really powerful time. Um, to be in the digital consumer space. Sure. Um, I would like to add on to like what Shadana and Elle said. Uh, prior to uh, COVID or the, like 2020, uh, online and kind of like physical retail, like, I mean, we talk about convergence, but it actually was kind of like a more of a divergent path, right? Uh, online was all about replenishment, uh, things that you've already kind of like decided what you want to buy, and then you're finally making the final choice. Or you've purchased before and you're now buying another unit or replenishment, right? Uh, and physical was all about discovery and something like like a higher price point uh, or something like like a, like a dining table that you like you really want to kind of like feel and like kind of understand the dimensions and stuff. But 2020 has forced us to also consider non-replenishments through online channels. So now, as a result, like so, like, physical retail is slowly kind of like adapting to like okay, we need to sell online. And similarly, online is now finding this new additional like, kind of like peripheral market of non-replenishments. And, and that's where they're kind of like, almost like, like competing or convergence or, yeah, that's where things are going. Yeah, and sorry, I would just add to that, you know, a great example of this. So Interior Defined, for those who aren't familiar, is a custom furniture business. So our average price point was $2,400. So it's a very consultative purchase to your point, you know, like a dining room table. and. And so, you know, our, our discovery was always in store. Our, our discovery was online. Our customer journey was online to in store, back to online to purchase. And yeah. so, you know, the way they've adopted with the pandemic is, and I'm sure we'll get into this more, but rebuilding what that in-person experience looks like, you know, with, with the use of technology and not slowing them down, which is, is interesting. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and what's interesting too about, uh, I think, you know, just last spring at this time, you know, all of our clients that were selling on Amazon, they quickly had to rethink FBA because all that was being able to be shipped into FBA was toilet paper. So having that, you know, distributed approach to commerce is now the new normal and essential. And having all your eggs in one basket is, is just no longer sustainable. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing, um, you know, Shazana from your end, what what you are seeing, especially because you have such a good footprint into retail, physical retail. How are people solving problems around supply chain and inventory? Yeah, um, I think uh, the the biggest piece um, and the biggest component of this is actually like dead inventory, right? So um, some of the biggest challenges we've seen is that's actually where most capital for a retailer, small or big, is tied up. It's the products that's sitting on your shelf. So one of the things that we saw is that when these retail stores close, you have all this money literally sitting on your shelves that aren't, isn't moving. So um, the ability to be able to um, use your retail store as a fulfillment center um, and using your proximity um, to fulfill local orders faster. So, um, you know, people want to save on shipping fees. They want to get their product um, faster when they need it. Um, that's the greatest advantage uh, that the retail locations actually have. But um, unless those products are online and people have visibility to what inventory is available at your store, you can't move that inventory. So that was one of the biggest shifts that we saw that happened during the pandemic. Um, again, big to small was I need to get my products um, that are available in my retail store, not just at my warehouse that I use or in an online marketplace. I need to make that product available um, and get it moving. 
Yeah, interesting. And I bet you have a lot of those uh, situations that you run into as well, Sunil. Um, how are you seeing that play out in, in your industry? So, uh, I mean, we are in primarily in the clothing and fashion accessories uh, space. So it's it's very cyclical. I have spring hits and new season drops. Uh, average auto values go up because everything is selling at full price. And as the summer kicks in, it drops. And then I come fall again, like September, October, it starts climbing up again. And then like January it drops. So it's, it's, it's a very kind of like two big waves. Last year, we did not have that increase in auto value because uh, everybody was kind of like, like Ashton and I indicated, like, everybody had taken deliveries of their stock and now they were like trying to just kind of like liquidate it at whatever cost they could uh so the average auto value kind of like stayed at like almost like discount level periods uh, mm -hmm. it didn't really go up uh, going forward like I, I see like okay online the big advantage that local or physical retail has is that whole like uh the same day you can like just go pick it up and buy the, the satisfaction, right? Uh, so online players also want to kind of like like mimic that uh, kind of behavior. Like Amazon has kind of like trained us very well. Best Buy is kind of like like kind of like figuring it and figuring it out. Uh, for other retailers, how do they kind of like bridge that gap of like okay, two to three day shipping or whatnot? So uh, we are seeing a lot of innovation around like know, like like the we work of warehouses. Like I think Flex is one big company that's come out of that. Uh, we'll probably see a lot more players in that space of uh, kind of like uh, either like kind of shared warehouses or even local warehouses where you can actually just go pick up things, uh, basically, like, yeah, democratizing what Amazon has kind of pioneered. Right. Interesting. What are you seeing from your perspective, Al, just in terms of supply chain? Yeah, you know, not not much to add on this topic, except that I think kind of, you know, what you guys are all implying is like people want things better, cheaper, faster. And that's where traditional brick and mortar retailer has historically always won. And so I think um, not not from a supply chain perspective, but from a technology perspective, we're seeing a lot of stuff around point of sale and checkout mm -hmm. that's that's helping you know, make those changes and, and making things come to you better, cheaper, faster. Um, the only other thing I will add to that is I actually have a social goods site on Shopify. So I'm a Shopify customer. Um, it's my side passion project. So I've, ha I've had a bit of experience as an e-commerce retailer. And I think, you know, I think a lot of the challenges for um, e-commerce has been keeping stuff in stock, right? And for 100%. me, you know, the challenge was between if you have a brick and mortar, if you have a Shopify site, and if you have an Etsy site, how are you managing that with this like influx of online business? And, and I understand that to be um, a common challenge that a lot of a lot of e-commerce people have experienced. Yeah. I think uh, just to kind of add up add to that, depending on the sector, like if it's like we've kind of had the shock of supply chain, um, and then we're like just like a traffic jam, right? Like cars bunch up together, and then it takes like waves to spread out, and then it kind of bunches up again, and then it spreads out again. I think we'll see those kind of like those ripples uh, for the next two or three inventory cycles. Uh, certain categories where things were oversold or like short of supply. Uh, probably will have some kind of like its own unique sort of supply uh, out of the like waves. Uh, and for our sector, like, okay, there is a lot of like uh, kind of like oversupply. Like, people are not buying dresses or shoes or bags during the pandemic. Like, everybody else at home, but like track pants and like t shirts and home goods were our top selling categories. Um, and now, they, like, all of our retailers have extra stock of those categories that did not sell, uh, they'll probably like purchase less next year. And then that actually induce like some sort of a shortage, right? There may be a shortage of dresses next year, who knows? Uh, and then like, it'll take a few more years or like maybe like a few cycles at least uh, to kind of like for the reports to kind of like die down and yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so, you know, I was just gonna say on that note, I think um, another thing that's just emerging around um, the ability to source products, right? Um, I remember talking to a merchant and they sold out of all their pajamas. Yep. You couldn't find a new supplier uh, for pajamas. And especially when you are a smaller retailer, your ability to access those supply chains and those vendors to be able to get the products. So you're seeing a lot of emergence happening between um, retailers selling to each other, especially on the mm -hmm. maker side. So going uh, direct, um, it's almost like going directly to businesses um, and uh, creating more of those marketplaces where you can source products directly from makers um, versus some of the traditional supply chain um, uh, that would exist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, is, that is super interesting. Um, 
you know, so I, I do feel like there there's all of these sort of cottage industries coming out of what I sort of characterize as, you know, the 2020 hangover of what really happened, you know, in, in the digital commerce space. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's an evolution for sure. And we're seeing it on many different levels. Um, and one of one of the interesting sort of aspects of that you brought up, Al, which is the future of money and and how, you know, you have your, you know, your 70 year old, um, you know, getting uh, groceries delivered, which is, you know, just mind blowing for them and for everybody else in their family, I'm sure, uh, down to like the 18 year olds who are making money on GameStop. Um, you know, through uh, Robin Hood and then, you know, buying Bitcoin, it's just, you know, it's natural for them. And, and then thinking about different ways that they spend money. So what are you seeing um, just in terms of the future of money and that connection to commerce? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Techstars and, and the Western Union Accelerator, um, so what we do is we source early stage startups to join our accelerator and put them through a, a 13 week um, soup to nuts kind of accelerator uh, for them to grow their businesses. And so my accelerator is specifically focused on FinTech. And so this question is near and dear to my heart. I'm currently in sourcing. So I talk to about 25 founders every week that are sharing their ideas and it's just fascinating stuff. Um, so obviously digital wallets, we're seeing a ton with digital wallets, but I think um, kind of the next step is that is, you know, how do we create digital wallet opportunities for the underbanked and the unbanked? And so we're seeing um, a lot there um, as far as like short term lending, you know, short term consumer lending. There's this company called Use Line that will give you a, a two hundred dollar line of credit, um, you know, over the course of seven days. And, and in you know, you get a lower rate than you would do at like a traditional payday loan. So we're seeing a lot of evolution for the again, for the unbanked and the underbanked. Um, uh, KYC, so you know fraud detection and you know any sort of digital identification. There's a ton of stuff. I probably talked to seven founders this week who are building something on that, and that's kind of for the sake of you know cheaper, better, faster. And then you know the one-click checkout. Um, you know Shopify has it right. WooCommerce is working on something. You know, um, so I think there's just um, I'd say kind of like one-click checkout, digital identification, and then. Um, any sort of uh, digital wallets that kind of serve underserved markets is, is what I'm seeing a lot of. Yeah, I think that there, yeah, I, th I think that there's also going to be a really interesting pickup that happens on the concept of buy now, pay later. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's it's been it's been there for quite some time um, and more prevalent in some geographies and in some age ranges. But I actually mm -hmm. think that that's going to really pick up steam um, just based on even like economic conditions that people have had to go through both personally um, during the pandemic. Um, and it's an interesting one because you think that buy now, pay later, pay later is tied to overextending yourself, right? Like in terms of whether it's to buy a couch, a pair of shoes, um, whatever it might be. Um, the fascinating trend that's happening is that people are using it more not to better budget their expenses. Like I know exactly how much I'm gonna have to pay over a certain amount of time, um, which allows for better personal finances. Um, and I think that just coming out of the pandemic where a lot of people and businesses have like lost their jobs and looks like financial situations are gonna be different. I see a lot of that, um, those type of financial offerings being able to help people. Yeah, and I think just kind of to that point, that is exactly what Use Line is doing, um, you know, kind of with these short-term loans. It's, loans. It's just a different version of a buy now, pay later. And exactly to your point, what's super interesting is they've discovered that their best customer is a single mom because she's using these kind of buy now, pay later opportunities to bridge the time in between paychecks. And so that emerged as their top customer, which was not what they were expecting at all. So definitely agree with that. At Garmentry, we have a sort of like a unique angle on the whole uh, buy now, pay later. Uh, at Garmentry, we're about fewer, better things. So rather than buying mass-produced tools at the lowest cost possible, uh, 
the emergence yeah. of like the, the millennial and Gen Z consumer as like the kind of like the next cohort, like with the highest kind of like the share of the economy, um, is forcing everybody to kind of like reconsider their sustainability and like in, in, in manufacturing and fair trade and all of those things, right? Uh, and that's expensive. Uh, that increases the cost of the goods. Uh, and rather than uh, the millennial Gen Z customer like buying something at the lowest cost possible, they are very aware of their like, like where the impact that their money is making. So they use uh, like we we kind of like we were one of the first merchants to offer like a buy now pay later uh, through a firm maybe like four or five years ago. Uh, close to like fifteen percent of our transactions go through that. Uh, and when you speak to the customers who use it, it's not because they are kind of like like trying to like bridge between paychecks. It's mostly to okay instead of me buying like a fifty dollar item, let me actually buy a quality item, uh, a beautifully produced like something that comes with a story of the designer and and you know that the model of the manufacturing. It's it's clearly manufactured and sustainable um, for two hundred dollars. So uh, they use that to kind of like like up their kind of like the quality of the product that they buy, up to the quality of the product. Yeah, I, it's like, I love that. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I'm a millennial, so I can make. I'm on the tail end, but I can make this joke. We're on the, you know, we're no longer just the avocado generation, avocado toast generation, right? We're moving into um, being the lion's share of um, the economic power, right? Like in terms of that that group actually aging. Um, and you're right, the behaviors and the mindset that this group has, um, even in terms of share of wallet and how they use their wallet, uh, in terms of being really afraid of debt, um, overpaying for things. Um, Paying for quality versus uh, quantity, I think um, a lot of that's going to shift um, how people pay and, and buy. Definitely. Yeah, and, and I was just going to add, Sunil, that's you know that's like exactly the Peloton customer, right? Is the same person that's using a firm, so it's for the non necessity items. And there's a ton of players now um, in that more traditional buy now, pay later space. And now we're seeing the emergence of you know unique angles and approaches to it for perhaps a different demographic totally as the as the market for online kind of like spending is increasing there'll be like everything gets commoditized whether it's uh, financing plans or just payment processing or sh like shipping services and like same day delivery right and then that's that's great for the consumer and great for merchants because now we can actually pick and choose uh, the best option that works for your customer, for your customer yeah. base so I have a question about how you know Shopify, you Sunil, how you're baking in these disruptions that have come out of 2020 into the software. So I know Shopify, I mean, we're Shopify experts, so we build a lot of Shopify sites. And I know, you know, pretty immediately a feature became available, which was curbside pickup. And that was great. I mean, it was like, you know, they, they quickly adapted to, you know, the reality of the times and, and gave people a way to, you know, sort of actualize that on the technology side. So how are you guys baking in all of these sort of emerging trends into, uh, into the build? So on our end, from a Shopify perspective, definitely there's um, features that we build natively into our products, right? So the ability to manage your um, a single book of inventory, both uh, for all of your online channels and in retail stores, just being able to do that in one place um, is transformative, I think, for any business, big or small. Um, and then features that allow you to buy online, pick up in store, buy in store, ship to home, things like that. But I think the really exciting and fascinating component that we've seen is actually from our ecosystem partners. So those are app partners um, that literally build their business on the Shopify platform itself. So um, things like being able to offer virtual um, in-store appointments or um, appointment scheduling to come into the store. Um, a lot of these um, trends and tools that retailers are using um, to really customize the experience that they want to create um, for their customers in the retail store is what I think has been a really cool thing that's really kind of blown up, right? How do I use my store staff? Um, there's not a lot of foot traffic. How do I use my store staff who are such really strong advocates and understanding of our product to actually help us sell digitally, right? Um, uh, there's some really cool app partners that have built tools for that for merchants. So um, I don't think it's just been what Shopify has been building. It's also been what our partners in our ecosystem have been creating for uh, for merchants. 
Yeah, so I'm sure, Elle, you're seeing the same thing with your ecosystem as well, just in terms of the, the startups that are coming to the table. I mean, it, it is, you know, they're coming out with the technology, but there's so many other, you know, levels and layers of integration that they can do with other partners like Shopify and, and others, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, going back to the example at Interior Define, we were actually building a hybrid sales team model prior to COVID as well because of this consultative sale. Um, so, you know, you can book an, a Zoom appointment or a FaceTime appointment, or like whatever technology works for you with our sales team, or you can come into the store and, um, you know, kind of what I, what kind of inputs I'm seeing since then is actually a former colleague just launched like a, a new SMS company the other day that, you know, personalizes assets. So there's like, there continues to be evolution in SMS. Um, it'll be interesting to see what kind of evolution there is in like the Zoom FaceTime for, you know, consumer salesperson interaction. I haven't seen anything exciting there yet. I don't know if you all have. Um, so, yeah, kind of a roundabout answer to your question. Sorry, but definitely, definitely yeah. seeing opportunities and exciting stuff in, in those arenas. Absolutely. Um, Sunil, anything to add to that? Um, I mean, we are in a sector where the curbside pickup is kind of cool, but it's not really like it's an emergency product, right? You, you don't want your product in like two or three days, like, like two or three hours. Uh, there's nothing really, uh, and many of our merchants are already on Shopify. They probably, many of them have their, their local customer base, probably shop through their own website and opted in for curbside pickup. We are about connecting boutiques to customers that are not in their city, like the New York boutique to customers in Kansas that doesn't have access to as many boutiques as New York does, uh, and vice versa. Uh, and that's, uh, and for us, like, but we did see a big shift in um, like the smaller radius kind of like uh, customer shop, uh, like the orders where customers shop, like New York customers are shopping from New York boutiques. We did see a big jump in that. Uh, and we've always offered like one or two day shipping. And yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of like worked out really well. Great. Well, you know, I think we talked a lot about sort of where we are now, you know, what, what has happened, um, you know, in the first part of Q1 of this year. Let's talk about the future. Um, you know, Shazana, from your end, what should brands and retailers be sort of planning from the near term and the long term, just in terms of like strategic planning when it comes to the convergence of digital and commerce? Yeah, this is a good one. So, I mean, one of the things that I, I feel like I'm sure a lot of brands are already feeling right now is uh, the cost per customer acquisition on digital it's just skyrocketing, right? Because everyone's trying, everyone's online, everyone's trying to reach their customers online. So that cost per customer acquisition is skyrocketing. So I just see brick and mortar retail as just being another channel that gets incorporated into like the cost per acquisition. Um, you'd see it as a Facebook or a Google ad. Um, you look at it the same way. Um, and I think that a lot of brands need to be thinking about their retail space um, as not just a place where um, you think about fulfilling orders from, like especially as things open back up, because um, you don't want customers making a decision based on price, right? Like might be able to search and find it online a little cheaper, right? What makes your retail space a value add in the chain that a customer doesn't get from buying online and digitally? Um, it's all about community and experience, experiential, right? So um, I think this was Nike that did this. Um, they put a running track in their store, right? Like I can put on the pair of shoes and I can actually try them out um, to get a feel for them. That's not something that you can do um, when you purchase something online or if you go into uh, an office furniture store, being able to have things set up so that a person can get a look and a feel of what uh, their office setup might look look like. Um, really thinking about um, your in-store merchandising um, and the events and the experiences that you create uh, to build community is how retailers, I think, are going to win, um, especially in physical retail. I love that. And I think that is such an opportunity for people to reimagine their retail space. Uh, I think if you're walking into a retail location and it's the same thing that you experienced two, three years ago, that's a missed opportunity. Elle, I know you have some thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm shaking my head vigorously. 
Um, cause I, I totally agree Shazana with everything you said. And, you know, it, it reminds me of trunk club. So for those of you not familiar, we were this men's outfitting service that had this incredible in-person experience. It kind of felt like a bar you'd go in, you'd meet with your, you know, your stylist for an hour. It would be just this like fun, almost night out. Right. And that was kind of innovative at the time. And, you know, then that kind of went away, right? People wanted to be shopping back online again. And, you know, my, my recommendation to people, and this is just all hypothesis, but human behavior always comes full circle, right? And so it's always happened with retail. You know, I've been in retail for 20 years and I've seen it go like this, right? E-commerce, you know, brick and mortar, e-commerce, brick and mortar. And people are hungry, are going to be so hungry for that in-person experience. And so, you know, Brandy, to your point too, like there's such a huge opportunity there. Um, call it future state a year or two years from now. Um, and then just touching on the point of customer acquisition, I would say kind of in the short term, you know, there is, uh, you know, Facebook, the ROI is really diminished and we really struggled with CAC because um, we were, you know, we were spending a million dollars a month on uh, marketing and we were putting most of that money towards Facebook and just started to see that diminish over time. And I think it more so has to do with Gen Z um, having a desire for authenticity um, and expertise. And so then we saw this emergence of um, content being the acquisition play. And I think that is is still true, you know, today, a year later from when I was doing this. So. Uh, we're seeing a lot around content. Like there's a company called Suna.co that's actually on the Shopify store that's fast, casual, creative content. And so, you know, I think there's a lot to be done with that. And then, you know, another good example of that is like we went from influencers with 3 million followers having value to micro influencers with 20,000 followers bringing a higher right. return. And I think that just all goes back to that desire for authenticity. I think uh, then I'll cover much of what, what, what I wanted to say, uh, but I see a parallel to uh, the food industry, right? Uh, yeah. There is the convenience, fast food, or delivery, or there is the experiential dining in. Like you, you pick restaurants to go to because it's kind of like like it's the whole like uh, experience. Uh, I think more uh, verticals will adopt that. Uh, mm -hmm. We've seen that in the past, like with all of like okay, the culinary stores having cooking lessons or uh, things like that, right? So, uh, and then the aggregation around like experiential like hubs within the neighborhood. So you have restaurants and probably like these few stores like like Bonos or um, Trunk Club, or I, I don't know if Trunk Club had any physical stores, but like Warby Parker and stuff having more more of it of a brand play rather than as a know, branding slash new customer acquisition play uh, rather than actually as a sales channel itself. Uh, so it's I see more of like, more of like a diversity, like okay, online hunting to be all about for the customer that's on the to buy, it's replenishment also, and then like physical retail being about okay, customer acquisition and discovery. It's it's hard for retailers because there's so much of uh, physical retail is impulsive buy. You walk into a store and then you see this like a, like, a, like a little item next to the checkout thing, and then you just pick that up. Uh, whereas online, it's purely things that you've already considered like wanting to buy. How do you yeah. encourage customers to increase their business to like their basket size? Uh, those will be like challenges, yeah. I, I love what you're saying about Gen Z, and I think an often overlooked group of people is Gen X. And Gen X is the parents of Gen Z, and yeah. they like to do things together. And I think that's maybe a little bit of a culture shift that's not so much talked about, but um, you know, uh, I think Gen Gen X remembers retail. They also grew up in digital somewhat. Um, so they are a, a sort of an untapped, underserved market, um, I feel, and, and especially having children that are Gen Z. So a, a lot of, uh, I think, opportunity there to engage that particular audience, um, for sure. Um, That's great. a great point. Never thought about that. Yeah, yeah. As I'm, a I'm also Gen as a Gen Xer. Yeah, me too. And I have Gen Z children. And yes, yeah. we went to the mall together on Friday. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And the same same with a lot of families. And you know, the, the Gen X and Gen Z is a whole thing that really people aren't talking about. And it's yeah. a massive opportunity um, yeah. when it comes to commerce. Um, you know, what's funny is we were looking at uh, even like folks that are still like teenagers right now, right? So. Um, I'm in like my tweens, my teens, um, and so I have a really interesting trend around um, that 
they like going into retail. So like Gen Z is like more convenience, right? Or um, on shopping online. But then the younger generation is like back to where like our parents are in terms of from a Gen X perspective. But the reasons for um, that in-store or retail experience is very different. For them, it's all experiential, right? Like entertain right. me. I want to feel human connection. Like I'm constantly on my phone or my iPad and it creates a more of a human connection. Whereas for even from a Gen X perspective, that's how I actually did my discovery and my shopping was originated from a retail store. So we're seeing that drive again into physical retail, but mm. the, the desires that those, um, the different people have is, is it, it's a, just a different driver. 100%. And, and, you know, if you think about it, Gen Z is the first generation where their parents played video games and grew up on video games. So, you know, we're all digital in most of the Gen X households. Um, you know, your, your husband can be playing video games right along with your teenager. So huge opportunity there, I think. Um, let, let's talk quickly about... Um, you know, Al, I'll throw it over to you. Um, how do you believe that companies um, can take a more collaborative approach to problem solving and, and really identifying solutions for the future of retail by engaging startups? I mean, so you're saying like larger companies, how can they exactly. they work together collaboratively? Well, they can start a Techstars Accelerator. Yeah, <laughs> yeah let's talk about that. Yeah, for no, sure. I mean, honestly, there are, you know, one great example is actually, I'll tell you, um, my good friend is, um, she's in venture capital and works for Graycroft and she now runs Albertson started a fund with them. So she runs a $50 million fund where Albertson's is searching and seeking kind of the most innovative, you know, early stage startups um, and grocery. And so, you know, the same thing goes with starting an accelerator. A lot of big companies, you know, do that, or they have their own innovation or venture arms, but, you know, I will say openly, you know, Western union brought us on because it's not something that they, know well right they don't know how to build from idea to you know like a hundred thousand customers because you know they've been around for 130 years and they've had billions of customers and so i think it's you know it's important that larger companies recognize you know maybe that's not our strong suit and you know our strong suit is certainly you know building these large you know conglomerates and so i think it's you know, I think it's a matter of finding ways to always be on the cutting edge of understanding what is emerging. Um, and those are kind of two ways for it to take form, whether it's in the form of venture or a more traditional accelerator. Great. And Sunil, I bet you can comment on that too, just knowing your experience yeah. with Techstars. I mean, I'm stating the obvious here, like, like large organizations, what they have is the adventure of scale, right? They have millions of customers um, and startups on the other hand, they have good ideas and they're nimble and they're flexible to like like customer feedback and adapt be able to like make changes that within like a month or two uh, that large organizations cannot and like afford to do that just because of the whole like structural um, you know, inefficiencies within large organizations. Um, but many startups I feel uh, I fear cannot give up because they test their ideas on like a, such a small subset uh, that even before they actually have a valid proof uh, they Kind of like like abandon the idea and then like want to like something else. Um, having a supportive corporate partner that can bring scale to validate those ideas, uh, I think is a win-win for both parties. Uh, yeah. And then yeah, and then as I'll mention, like like work, working through an accelerator program is like the perfect idea to kind of like for one organization to kind of like battle test or like test like like ten different ideas uh, from yeah in, in one go. So, Shazana, I want to ask you a little bit about, um, you know, your your app store and a lot of, you know, emerging um, startups that come through there. And then I also want to ask a, a follow up question about reviews while we have a little bit of time left. So go ahead. Oh, about the Shopify app store. Yeah. And the startups that are part of that. Yeah. So. Um, the Shopify basically from a platform perspective um, is we have a lot of um, APIs um, that our um, partners can use to build apps, right? So um, being able to offer an app to um, schedule a customer to come in. I gave you some examples before. Um, 
tons of different ideas. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of apps on the App Store. Um, but the really incredible part is, um, I'd say like Shopify builds for the 80%, 80 um, but that 20% of like the white space is actually where a lot of that innovation happens and um, customization happens that um, retailers um, can use uh, for their stores. So um, yeah, I think honestly, it's just, it is such a great opportunity to uh, build, um, put it out there in front of uh, merchants uh, to be able to use and leverage those apps. Um, and we also see a lot of private apps that are built. Um, so um, some of our larger merchants will actually hire developers to build apps that are custom and unique for their businesses um, for certain um, experiences they want or workflows that they need. Um, so it really creates that opportunity to um, I like to say like customize with clicks, not code for um, sort of the merchants that are using the product. Like you have somebody else build something that's really cool from a workflow and all you got to kind of do is download it and add it into um, into your uh, into your Shopify store and um, the app just works. Um, right. Which is cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, so that's a good segue talking about the app store as a as a Shopify developer, you know, a lot of that just in in that ecosystem lives based on reviews. So success is defined by reviews, even in the Shopify app store. But broadly speaking, I you know, I think there it deserves a conversation about reviews and how how much that really truly does impact the commerce experience. As we all know, you go to Amazon, you purchase something, you don't want to be the guinea pig, you're never buying a product that doesn't have a review and at least 3.5 stars and up. So how have you guys sort of um, seen people navigating the complexity of reviews? There's certainly a lot of fraud. It's really hard to get reviews. It's hard to get legitimate reviews. How are you guys sort of seeing that all play out just in terms of, you know, how, how it's actually impacting things? Um, I mean, online, on the online customer prefers choice. Uh, it's 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 like I don't know, like two sided. Like they want more choice, but they also want some sort of like guide or curation, right? And reviews are one way to kind of like narrow down there and like solve the paradox of choice. Uh, and then there are other kind of like reviews. Reviews are important, and then there's also stuff that what when you walk in a physical store, you can feel the product, and you can actually kind of like be the gauge uh, judge yourself. Uh, online, you don't have the luxury, so videos, uh, influencer kind of like you know, recommendations, uh, all of them are playing kind of like a, a piece, uh, like, like, like pieces of the puzzle to kind of give you more confidence into making your purchases online. So um, I don't know if that's where I, I don't think your question was leading, but yeah, I kind of like to give that way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would add that, you know, reviews are, are hugely important, the livelihood of, of a, an online business, because that's really kind of what you have to hold on to, right? Um, and, you know, there are a dirty little secret. There are, you know, a lot of ways as a retailer that you can um, influence reviews, right? Like, you know, there's Yapo, there's a ton of plugins, there's power reviews, you know, things you can do post-purchase, but you know, you can choose who those get sent to. And um, th there's just a, a lot of workflows you can build around asking for reviews post-purchase. Um, so we did not take that lightly at Interior Define, and we had a, a pretty uh, in-depth system around trying to source the best reviews possible. Um, and then anytime we got a bad review, you know, our customer experience team we had a person dedicated to calling those people. And this is, you know, a company getting tens of thousands of reviews, but even those those bad reviews, you know, if they're most recent, that's what your buyer is going to see. So uh, we put a lot of weight on, on the review process. Yeah, on, on that note, two, two comments on this. Um, I actually was looking for a product um, myself the other day. And when I was looking at the reviews of the product, a lot of the comments, in my mind, I'm like, that would have actually could have been a really negative review. It was like something was missing, something broke off, but every single one of those people left a five-star review. And the reason was because of the customer service. They're like, 
I called customer service and I got the help I needed to fix the problem. So even if, even though there was a problem, they still left a five star review. It's more. It's not just about your product. It's about all the things that you incorporate in to del deliver a great customer service that's going to impact your review. So like great if you're point. getting negative reviews, take stock at not just your product improvements that need to be made, but the process you have with um, the reviews. And then another thing is like just like getting sucked into like the reviews uh, and just only focusing on like the reviews you have um, with like on Amazon or on Google, right? Mm -hmm. Those are important. But think about referrals um, as a way to drive reviews, right? So um, having your best customers and getting really innovative with how you actually engage your biggest fans in driving that, like even yesterday, I think I, I, I bought a hiking backpack because in a Facebook group I was in, somebody was just talking about this amazing backpack that they had that they loved. I didn't even do any other research. Like I, I opened it and somebody else was like, yeah, this thing's great. And I, I purchased it. Like I didn't look at the star reviews um, that it had, especially when I was going direct to the, the, the manufacturer, right? Um, so it, it's also not just about, um, it's creating more referrals um, and different ways to think about reviews. Yeah, it's almost like a component of advertising at, at this point, really. Yeah. Absolutely. And I would just add one little um, snippet for those of you who do Facebook advertising. If you haven't done this already, one of our most successful campaigns ever was building lookalike audiences off of five star reviews. So if you haven't done that, do that. Yeah, that's a good tip. Um, okay, cool. Well, I have a couple of questions here from the audience that um, that I'll get to now. So. Um, I've got a question here from Aaron. Um, he's asking what disruptive technology is going to change how we engage with the retail of the future. Anyone want to take that one? Uh, I mean, this is probably a blasphemy, uh, but as a technologist, like uh, this commonly like a technology trying to like find like, like as a solution, like leading with this technology as a solution. Uh, but I think I'm borrowing this from somebody, but I know it's somewhere Think about what the customer of the future wants, right? Rather than what does the technology kind of like is going to change? How is technology going to change retail? Uh, what does the consumer of the future want? Uh, I mean, they want convenience, they want confidence, they want good quality products at a great price, uh, and then start thinking about how do you, how does technology solve those problems? Uh, so let's uh, focus on like just the online uh, kind of like, like sector of purchases and over there like. So much. There's a lot of like brand storytelling. What needs to happen now? Now that it's online, uh, I think as El mentioned, ROI on advertising is kind of like dropping significantly. So you need to build a more loyal audience to your brand. Previously, the, the retailers acted as like the curators or the gatekeepers, like who recommended brands. But now, brands and the, uh, brands and basically like the brands have to build their own audience. Uh, how do you go about that? And that's where like, okay, just ads is not going to work because this is a customer that you haven't reached. Uh, what are some technology, like, not technology, but more like what are solutions and services that can actually help brands tell stories? I think there's a lot of exciting stuff around VR and AR, um, but in store, at, you, you know, kind of to Shazana's point, which I thought was super interesting around these younger people want experiences. And so, um, you know, anything there, there, there's great opportunity. I know um, Rebecca Minkoff is an apparel brand that's known for being really innovative in the digital space. And, you know, a couple of years ago, they were doing some very cool things in the fitting room, even where, you know, you put your leather jacket on the hook and all of a sudden something pops up on the screen. It shows the jacket worn a bunch of different ways. So, um, I mean, this is, again, I, this is a hypothesis, but I, I would imagine that evolving as that in-store experience demand increases. I was going to hit on the exact same point, like around <laughs> air and beer, and it sounds really futuristic, but I don't, I don't think it's yeah, that yeah. far, even, even in the early explorations of what that might look like. Um, I think we're going to start seeing some really um, interesting thing happen. Ha interesting things happening with AR and VR um, in terms of product discovery um, and also in-person shopping. Yeah, which is a great segue into the next question here, which is 
how can we explain what happened to Fry's Electronics or similar retailers, Blockbuster? What were the pitfalls that you guys see from, from your lens? Uh, even even before the pandemic, like, there were certain sectors. Uh, I mean, even right now, we talked about like online share shifted from 18% to 23% or whatever, right? Uh, but that's across all verticals. And certain, vector, uh, certain verticals were already much, much ahead. Uh, electronics, I don't know when was the last time I actually bought an electronic goods uh, in store. And I mean, thinking about it, and then it, it comes down to like how much variability do we have in your product? Uh, a laptop, yeah, you can like probably configure like four or five things, and that's pretty much it. And if there's so much confidence in what you're buying in a laptop or a TV or any other electronic item, uh, so there's less variability. And then when there's less variability, you have more confidence uh, either, yeah, that you could actually make those purchases online. And Fry's had a very large physical footprint in many cities. Uh, and then, as I think, like, there are certain other sectors where the online penetration like furniture is probably very, very low at this point, uh, mostly because there's so much variability in every single chair. It kind of feels different, the fabric is different. Um, so it, it, it all depends on verticals, and I think that electronic is probably close to 80% in terms of online. Yeah. Yeah, electronics just aren't emotional purchases, and so it's a it's a price grab, and I think kind of the surgeons <clears throat> of online electronic sales uh, just beat those traditional big box retailers in that category. Right, and I I'd say that um, it's more about knowing what your competitive advantage is. It's not the products you sell; it's your brand, right? So it's about thinking about how to create a new competitive advantage for yourself, right? So electronics were becoming commoditized in terms of from a price perspective and even discovery online. So what would your brand do differently to drive that traffic? It's not about having those items in stock, could have been something more experiential or something that could have changed it. Um, and I think that goes to like how tech um, accelerators and startups can help is that kind of like moving a moving a big ship that's going in a certain direction is hard for an organization to do internally all by themselves, and by partnering with smaller um, in like um, accelerators um, and uh, tech innovators to think about new ideas and new business models for your big ship um, can actually really help um, chart a new course. Great. Well. This is a this is a nice segue into the next question, which is um, you know sort of related to brand. Um, but how do you guys see retailers sort of directing their attention to selling via social media platforms? So actually having sort of you know Instagram stores, Facebook stores, um, you know TikTok obviously represents a, a super interesting opportunity. So how are you guys seeing this just in terms of social media and the convergence of of commerce? I, I'll, I'll chime in on this one. I think it's twofold. Like one, it's a way to reach consumers in terms of like the platforms that they're on. But I also think that there's a really cool opportunity for brands to um, leverage it as a promotional perspective, right? So even like, for example, in your store, um, having an Instagrammable moment that people use uh, to come and take a picture of themselves in your store and they're posting it on their social channels, it just becomes an organic way to get your brand out there. So I, I see it as one, as like a way to reach customers um, that you're paying for and brands creating those um, organic moments uh, through their customers to drive that visibility. What do you, what are you guys seeing? Do you have anything to add there, Al? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a discovery arena um, more than a point of sale arena. But I got to be honest, like I did not jump on the TikTok, TikTok wagon and I understand it's a quite powerful tool. So um, I, I'd love to learn more about it. But, you know, even just in my social goods site, you know, I did get a lot of business um, driven to me from, from Instagram. Um, but ultimately, you know, the purchase was made separately. Uh, on our side, like every social network seems to be kind of like aligned with generations. Uh, there are the Facebook, Gen X, or Y, Millennial, Instagram, and Z is TikTok. Uh, depending on the product you're selling, 
you kind of like pick your uh, audience. Uh, it, it's fantastic that all of these channels help you kind of like micro target your audience, convince Susanna to buy um, the bag that you got from the Facebook group, right? So, uh, and, and, and that that works. Uh, and then the, the, the long term question is like, when things get saturated and costs go out of control, uh, how do you approach that? And that's where I think like innovative campaigns and stuff. I, I know it's like it's, it's nothing new. Uh, it's adopt new channels as they come up uh, when the costs are low, and then before they get saturated again. Yeah. Ali, you hit on this, which was original content, right? Like people are responding more to content, whether it's on TikTok, like teach me a new recipe, show me a new thing, right? The product will sell itself once they understand the value and how to um, how how they can get value out of it. So um, investing in original content um, is definitely the way to go. I have one more quick question and we'll just do like a lightning round because I think it's really interesting. And the question is related to grocery and how are you guys seeing the future of, of grocery just given everything that's happened? Um, I've seen a few interesting companies come through my pipeline that um, are focused on uh, fulfillment and inventory management um, using some AI, some AR, some VR stuff. So um, robotics, and so there, there's definitely um, a surge in, a surge in that. And there's um, also a lot of companies that are trying to utilize fulfillment, uh, like in an Uber model. So pinging people, saying, "Hey, can you know." Dole oranges wants to know how much they have left in inventory. Can you, you know, you it looks like you're 17 miles from the store. We'll pay you eight dollars to go over and check on the inventory. So it's funny. I'm seeing it both the human capital side and also on the tech side, but definitely around uh, fulfillment. I'm seeing a lot. Great. Anyone else? Grocery, really quick. Ten seconds. I, I don't have any insights from the kind of the retailer side. Purely from a consumer side, uh, I suppose you could like walk into Whole Foods twice a week, and like, like spend about like an hour, like the whole like driving, picking things, coming back home. Right uh, now, the last for the last year, I haven't been inside of Whole Foods, um, and I think that's a permanent change. Um, right compared to other verticals, uh, consumers are likely to kind of go back for the experiential. This is now kind of like experiential shopping and grocery shopping. Right. Uh, I mean, nobody's come up with anything. Uh, it just feels like a chore. Uh, and I feel like the shift towards online there is more prominent than in any other way. It's based on personal experience. Though. Great. Anything else to add? Um, and then we'll wrap it up because we're out of time. Good. All right, cool. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. If you'd like to learn more about opportunities um, about accelerating innovations by partnering with startups, we invite you to learn more about Techstars Accelerator and Startup Engagement Solutions. Um, and you can visit Techstars at techstars.com. You can also visit Garmentory at garmentory.com, uh, shopify.com, and, uh, and our company, which is spaceshopcommerce.com. Thanks everyone for joining us today. All right, thank you so much. Thanks.